<clears throat> All right. Well, hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Nick Harang, and I'm so glad that you are joining us. Uh, whether you're live with us this morning or you're watching the recording at another time, uh, we are really grateful that we get to share this time with you. And I'm going to make sure that we are recording. Yeah, we are recording. Good. All right. Well, again, hello and welcome to the Thrive Today webinar. Uh, we have a great hour ahead of us as we are going to be talking about how to thrive relationally during the holidays. Uh, you know, it's amazing to think that Thanksgiving is just next week and then Christmas is right around the corner. And we know there's a lot going on, a lot of busyness and relational events coming and going. And uh, we want to help you with some skills and some practical tips on how to not just survive the holidays, but really thrive in them. And I'm glad this morning to be joined by my good friends, uh, Amy Brown and Chris Corsi. So hello, Amy. Hello, Chris. Hello. Good to be here. Yeah, we're, uh, we're going to have some fun this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are. Uh, and if you're new to Thrive Today, allow me to introduce these wonderful people to you. Chris Corsi, together with his wife, Jen, lead Thrive Today. And for over 20 years, Chris and Jen have been creating and practicing and training others in brain-based solutions to make relationships work. Uh, Chris is an ordained minister. He travels all over the world and spreads these good skills and, and truths to people in many different contexts. And he's published uh, several books that have really been helpful to me and to many people I know. So, so glad you're with us, Chris. Hey, thank you, Nick. I tell you what, we're going to have fun today. This is a topic that I'm passionate about, just how to keep those joy levels high during seasons of busyness. Yeah, that's fantastic. And Amy is also with us. Amy Brown is a trainer for Thrive Today at the, the True Identity Track at our Thrive trainings that we offer several times a year. And she's also a, a co-author with Chris on the book that came out earlier this year called Relational Skills in the Bible. And she volunteers and speaks with Life Model Work. She oversees our journey groups at Deeper Walk. Uh, Amy, you are a very fruitful and busy lady. So we're glad that you could join <laughs> us today and share some of these things. Yeah, I'm excited about it. The holidays are a wonderful time of year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, and that's the thing is that holidays are meant to be a time of joy and celebration and time of connecting with friends and family and feasting and enjoying. Uh, but I also know that for many of us, holidays can be a mixed bag or even a painful time. I imagine there's some friends of ours watching today that might not live near family, might not get to spend time with family and friends in the way that they would hope. Um, some of us might have lost a loved one in recent times, and, and the holidays can bring up even some relational pain and sadness about what we're missing in terms of loved ones that we once had at these holiday times. Uh, and others of us are getting together with friends and family, but we're kind of wondering, you know, is, is Uncle Bob going to kind of go off the rails and say those inappropriate things like last year, or is a table topic going to turn to politics and we're going to have a food fight on our hands? I mean, what... You know, how is this going to be? We want to be together, but what are we going to experience when we are? Uh, so that's why we're glad to be talking today about some of the 19 relational brain-based skills that have been identified by Thrive Today. And we want to share just a few of those and how they can practically be applied to our lives in such a way that we can have as joyful and peaceful and meaningful of a holiday season as possible, given our circumstances. Uh, so, Chris, you and Jen and your family have been practicing what are known as these 19 relational brain skills for a long time now. And um, I'm sure people watching may be familiar with them, but some folks may not. So would you just take a moment and just describe what are brain-based relational skills and, and why are they important? Okay, Chris just cut out for a second. So I'm going to bounce that ball to you, Amy. He's uh, joining us in a minute. Are you ready, Chris? Hello there. Sorry, I didn't have any sound there for a moment. Okay. Did you hear didn't, my question? I didn't. Sorry. Okay. You know, we love technology, especially when it works. Uh, yes. Yes. <laughs> and when it doesn't, you know, we make the best of it. So, Chris, the question was, most people watching may be familiar with the 19 skills, but some yeah. people may not. It may be a new idea that there's these brain-based relational skills that can really help us. So, can you just describe briefly what is a brain-based relational skill and, and why is it important? Yes, you know what? All of us are born into this world and, and it's with a blank slate. We have all these great genes and this genetic potential in our brain, in our body, um, but it's interacting with other human beings that actually helps to express these genes. And so relational skills are part, um, really expressing some of the good stuff that God's placed in us. So 
we learn relational skills from the people who interact with us. So mom and dad and others uh, have a really strong relational skills. We will receive those as they download and use them. Uh, you know, like building joy, learning to rest and, and learning to get back to joy and so forth. Yeah. But when our families and our communities just don't have a full of these skills and we only learn kind of pieces of these skills. So uh, yeah, this is the good news is this is something we can learn later in life, no matter what happened during our childhood or our growing up formative years, we can still learn relational skills. Well, mm -hmm. amen. That gives me hope because I've been on a, a journey of, of learning about them and filling in some holes in my life. And uh, it's been transformative for me and, and my family. So, um, well, Chris, can you share with us uh, maybe some of the skills that you find helpful during times like the holidays? Yes. Well, I'm very excited to talk about some of these relational skills. And Nick, you said something very important. I just want to really acknowledge you with our friends that uh, my 97-year-old grandmother uh, li lived with us for a number of years, and every Christmas she would say something really interesting, that um, Christmas wasn't joyful for her growing up because there was a family accident. She lost her brother uh, when she was young, so every Christmas was a reminder of loss, and I just really want to acknowledge that, that, you know, some of us holidays are joyful and festive, and we're just so excited for the holidays, but you know, some of us, we don't feel the warm, fuzzy feeling. Um, so what we're going to talk about today is just how to really keep joy levels high, no matter what you you have associated with the holiday. I want to see how do we maximize the good stuff relationally. So thank you for mentioning that, Nick. Uh, that was a very sure. good point. So yeah, so big question that came to my mind, Nick, was you know how do I come out of the holidays with a smile on my face? What we're after today. So as we embark on this journey, we're going to engage what we call the captain in the brain. The captain is what Thrive we call level four of the brain's control center. And the captain is basically in charge of personal identity. So when you think about who am I, right, that is a function of this part of the brain. It's behind your right eye. Um, and it just, it's in charge of your personal preferences. You know, this is how I like my coffee. Not too cold, not too hot, just the right amount of creamer. Um, it's also the center for emotional regulation. So how do I regulate what I feel? And how do I stay connected and regulate with you when you're upset? So it's, this is where we weep together and rejoice together. And the captain is what allows us to be creative. Um, we feel satisfied when the captain's online because we know what's satisfying, we know what's not satisfying. And we have goal-directed behavior. How do I get from point A to point B? Um, and the cool thing about the captain is it helps us think through um, most, what's most rewarding or avoiding what's most painful. So when this, when, the, when this captain is not working or he's not online, we feel lost. We, we don't have a purpose. Uh, our path is unclear. We're just kind of living in the moment. We don't quite know where we've been or where we're going. Sounds like a good Bon Jovi song. I don't know where I've been, only God knows where I'm going, right? That is what it really um, looks like and sounds like when the captain's not working very well. Um, so we want to engage the captain today. Um, that's, that's what we're trying to do is, okay, let's go into the holidays with the captain online, thinking through uh, what, what do we want to see and what do we want this to look like? So the big million dollar question is what's important to you about the holidays? So we're going to ask some important questions here. You know, when you look back on the holidays, what is it you want to see? All right. Um, I will be glad that I did these things. What would that be? What do you want to do? What do you feel like is a good expression of your values and your heart and your faith for the holidays? Um, you know, who do you want to spend time with? Who will, what, who are the people that you'll say, I'm really glad I connected with these people over the holidays that we grabbed coffee. Mm. Um, what are the activities that you'll be glad that you did? Or what are the things you'd want to say to your loved ones, to your friends, to the people that you'll be with? You know, I really want to make sure they know that I love them. They, they, I want them to know how much they really helped me in this past year. Whatever those conversations are, uh, just get some clarity. What is it you want to see? Um, and what is it you'd like to convey? And um, you know what, what's, what is the most likely thing to hinder you from achieving these goals, right? Yeah. I mean, let's face it, for me, as I think about the holidays, um, sometimes I just get a little bit overwhelmed because there's so many things I want to do. There's so many people I want to see. And sometimes then I just don't know what I'm going to do because I get kind of stuck in that. So 
we can think about what's likely to hinder you. Let's identify that. And let's start talking to Emmanuel about those possible hindrances that are coming. Yeah. And Chris, if I can just weigh in, I mean, I, I love this way of thinking because I know for me, whether it's a vacation, whether it's a holiday season, there's something special coming up. I feel all these hopes rising. I have all these hopes and desires, but if I don't articulate them uh, ahead of time, I'm just kind of drifting with the current and whatever happens, happens. And I might look back with some disappointment. Uh, but when I look at this kind of model of like, hey, fast forward and be January 3 <laughs> and look back and, you know, who, did, who are you glad you spent time with? What are you glad you did? What are you glad you shared? It's like, wow, I can actually kind of identify the things that are going to make it the most meaningful possible. And I can be a little more intentional about what I choose to do versus, again, drifting with the busyness of the season. You know, that's well said. I mean, the captain's what really allows us to be intentional. It's a good word. You know, a little bit of intentionality goes a long way. Um, and any, you know, you think of people like Stephen Covey and, and, and his works and his very popular books. Um, a lot of what these great writers are, are really kind of capturing with these materials is it's engaging the captain. So yeah. if you want to um, begin with the end in mind, you need the captain, right? So this goal-directed yeah. behavior, seeing a big picture, these are all really part of the emotional brain that we really want to have online. Otherwise, the holidays will come and go, and we'll just kind of get swept. By That's the big... great. Well, I know we can't just start with the captain. There's kind of some foundational things that need to happen first. So can you talk to us about the master switch? Yeah, so the master switch is really what helps to keep the captain online. And this is really exciting news that all of us, there's practical things we can do uh, starting today to really maximize joy and, and stay relational with the people that we care about. Um, I like the analogy of just keeping your relational oxygen mask on, right? Whenever there's turbulence on the airplane, you got to put the oxygen mask on. So part of it, part of staying relational means just caring for yourself, noticing, wow, I'm offline right now because I'm really mad about this or I'm really triggered because, you know, my dad's grumbling about the burnt turkey again or whatever those family issues <laughs> tend to be, right? Um, just, okay, how do you pause? How do you take care of yourself? How do you get your relational brain back online? Because really engaging the master switch helps us to be the best version of ourselves in good times or bad. So start practicing now before you even get together with people. And one of the best ways you can get relational, get the master switch on is what we call the Shalom My Body exercises. Um, these are very quieting, body quieting exercises. Um, we've, we've demonstrated these on a lot of webinars. We have it on our YouTube page, Chris Corsi dash thrive. Uh, you can see Dr. Wilder doing it, but Basically, you want to do these very practical exercises that help to quiet your body. Uh, mm -hmm. Your body is the canvas for your brain. So this, you learn these practical exercises. They just take literally seconds and minutes to do, and you get a lot of bang for your buck because it helps to activate uh, your relational brain once again. Mm -hmm. and, and there's another really valuable uh, habit here, which is you know, how to help my mind quiet which also helps my body quiet. And that's just using appreciation, right? Appreciation, as we'll talk soon, is just packaged joy. How do I amplify the good stuff? Thinking about what I enjoy, thinking about the people I enjoy, the events that I enjoy. What am I thankful for? All of these things, Nick, really help to, to bring some peace. So we'll start practicing these things today. Don't delay. It sounds like a good car commercial, but yeah. honestly, <laughs> practice this now. It will translate when you get into those circumstances that, you know, with family, it can be the, the best of the best, but we all tend to have some hurts and baggage with our family. So you're getting into this kind of melting pot of conditions. Start doing this stuff uh, before you actually get there. And, mm. and then the, the big question is, what does it look like for you to be relational? And so as you think about how do I be relational under these conditions? So for me, you know, it looks like um, I love people a lot. So I enjoy connecting with people. And the moments that I'm feeling offline relationally, it's like me to go get a little time out and just kind of take care of myself, go for a walk, do whatever I have to do, then enter back in. So, mm -hmm. so guys, these are really practical steps. And, and Nick or Amy, I'm eager to hear what yeah. thoughts are percolating in you as you think about all this. Yeah, I was going to ask Amy because she's a, she's a master at teaching about and practicing the master switch. So how, how have you yeah. found this helpful in your life and maybe even especially at the holidays? 
Yeah, I think looking ahead and recognizing, okay, I know there are certain things that might um, be, uh, might dim my, my master switch, might dim my relational circuits and kind of just um, almost like creating a map of your holiday, um, you know, weeks that, okay, here's where I need to be aware of um, and be prepared to do shalom my body or really notice some appreciation. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, being aware of what um, turns our relational circuits off or dims them helps us to keep them on yeah. and brighten them. That's, that's really great. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And again, you can just Google the quotes, Shalom My Body, and you'll, you'll find that. And Lots again, we teach these at our Relational Building Blocks uh, Saturday mm -hmm. webinars, which are all available. The past ones, you can check those out on our yeah. events page. And uh, we have future ones coming in 2020, we'll uh, be sharing about in the weeks to come. So, well, skill zero is the master switch, and then skill one takes us to share joy. So, Chris, what do we need to know here? Yes, this is an exciting one. You know, we call the, the relational circuits the master switch because it basically – turns on the whole circuit board so that we can build joy and we can do these skills. So when your relational circuit's on, it, it often comes on because you're about to build some joy, which is skill one, sharing joy. Um, so joy is just simply glad to be togetherness. So it's expressed authentically with your face, your voice, your body. And uh, it's just, you know what, I'm glad to be with you and I show it and I, and I share it. And of course, we want our words to confirm and affirm that glad to be togetherness as well. But your emotional brain's really looking for the nonverbal dance that's going on. So when you're going to be with people, I've always made it a, a high value for me, particularly with nephews. Um, I will make the effort to really build some joy. And um, it's fun to hear the effect over the years. They'll say, you know, I don't know why Uncle Chris loves me so much. You know, they'll just mm -hmm. say these things. Because when you're really glad to be with people, we feel loved, right? Mm -hmm. We feel loved when people are genuinely glad to be with us. So uh, joy basically sets the tone for your interactions, um, and it sets the tone for the gathering. Um, so I find that joy really is part of a legacy. Like when you think about the holidays, you think about the legacy you want to leave with your family, your friends, your community, your people. Joy is like foundational for that. People feel loved when you're glad to be with them. Um, sure. So just keep that yeah. lens in mind, right, as we go into the holidays. Um, and joy also leaves a lasting impression. So it sets a tone. It sets a, kind of the atmosphere, so to speak. But it also makes an impact on people. Um, what tends to impact people is the, the images. So seeing you genuinely glad to be with them. Mm -hmm becomes part of like how they'll look back on the holidays and, and kind of have this lens. Were my people glad to be with me? Mm -hmm. um, but what's really cool is joy is contagious. So you can see a little bit of joy starts to, you know, go throughout the room. Pretty soon everybody has a smile on their face. Um, and, you know, I just want you know, I want to make this distinction. Joy is not happiness. Like, you know what? It might be a very difficult season for your family. And joy means, hey, if I'm going through this stuff, I'm glad I'm here with you people. I'm glad I'm here with yeah. all of you. So we, we keep that in mind. Joy respects limits as well, that sometimes we don't overwhelm people with our excitement. So when I'm building joy with my nephews, uh, for example, I'm watching for overwhelm cues, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. Because <laughs> joy has to be digestible uh, for us all. And, and Basically, the, again, the million dollar question is, what is it like you? Um, how is it like you to be joyful? What does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it appear like when you are glad to be with your people? Um, this isn't the time to assume that people know that you love them. This isn't the time to make assumptions. Like this is the time to be glad to be with people and convey it and express it. Um, so I like to see the holidays as this is a chance I'm going to see family members I don't always see very often. So what do I want to say? And particularly, what do I want to show when they see me when when I see them? You know, what do I want that to look like? So that's, guys, that's kind of what I'd like to leave on that point and really good. open it up for you too. Anything on that, Amy? Well, you know, I'm thinking about um, how challenging uh, the holiday season is for um, all of us, but particularly people that work in retail environments and teachers and so forth. And, 
you know, we can maintain our joy level if we're um, paying attention to those opportunities to share joy when we're doing our errands. There's lots to be done around the holidays. And so noticing children is great because the kids tend to be really excited. And so smiling at the children that I see in the stores and, um, you know, giving a um, compassionate smile to the moms when the children are having a rough time and saying, you know, you're going to get through this, showing that we're glad to be around them. Um, and that kind of sets a tone so that when we go into our holiday gatherings, we've um, kept those joy levels fairly high as we're doing all of the things that lead up to it. We tend to think of um, being together with family as the time that we're really going to have our joy, but we can feel joy anywhere. Yes, that's right. That's, so that's good. a great point. Well, the corollary to joy, Chris, I understand learning from you and Dr. Wilder that our brains are designed to run on the, the rhythm of joy and engagement, and then we need some quiet. We need a little yes. downshift. So can you talk to us about skill two? Yeah, so quiet is really what makes joy possible because if we don't get to disengage and recharge, then it's going to be really hard to build joy. So, you know, this rest and this quieting really is just so important. You got to remember to breathe. You know, joy is high energy, rest is low energy. So you just, yeah, you just have to remember to breathe and take those deep breaths um, and pause. You know, pausing and quieting really does create some safety and some peace. And so, and I see that um, maybe then my sons, for example, get really amped up with a lot of joy over the holidays. I'm going to be watching for when we all just need a moment, a little, a little disconnect to just go rest, to just have a little, we call it like cuddling time. Like, okay, you're gonna have a little cuddling time with daddy here. Or Good. when my wife, I can hear by the, the tone of her voice, I know when she just needs a little breather. Um, and for myself, I feel tension in my shoulders, my chest. Okay, I'm going to go just take a little pause. Um, you can step out, you can step in another room. Again, you could step outside, step in the bathroom, whatever you have to do um, to just relationally quiet. Um, and just even giving other per people permission to relationally quiet. Um, some family members have a harder time with this one. And so we might have to just invite them. Hey, you, you look like you're, you're maxed out. Do you need a breather? Like sometimes you just give an invitation, whether that they take it you know, it's up to them, but I like to give the invitations like, hey, what do you need right now? Looks like you're getting pretty stressed with all the people in the, in the kitchen. Should we, let me help, let me get some of the kids outside and just take a moment to pause. Yeah. Um, so a little quieting can go a long way during gatherings. And, you know, I want people to think about today, friends, like how is it like you to be restful? What does it look like? What does it sound like? Um, what kinds of things do you do in order to be a restful presence, in order to quiet and recharge? I just like people to be thinking about that uh, as we go into the holiday season here. Yeah, and one thing that I've been kind of challenged by is that uh, in times past, it wasn't this way. But now, I, when I switch gears, sometimes I just reach my, for my phone and just see what's on the news feed or see what's happening on Facebook and just fill in those minutes with another form of engagement. And in my mind, I'm resting, but my mind is not resting. My brain is engaging a whole bunch of new information and a screen and all of that. Yeah. So I'm trying to be better about it. Like, okay, mm -hmm. you know, what do I need right now? Do I just need to take a little five minute walk? There's a little hill across the street. Sometimes I walk up and walk around and talk to the Lord for a minute and come back. Or if I don't have time for that, sometimes I'll just go sit in my walk-in closet for set my timer for two minutes and close my eyes and take some deep breaths and, it's amazing how I don't think I have time for that because I'm busy, but when I take those two minutes or those five minutes, uh, the next few hours, I just got the, a surge of peace and, and fresh energy. So uh, yeah, that's what I found to be helpful in, in recent times. That's cool. Mm, yeah, that's that's, I like how practical that is, Nick. That's, that's what it's all about. That's fantastic. Yeah. Well, we've got some more skills I want to make sure we try to cover. Yes. So talk to us about skill four. Great. All right. Skill four, again, that's what I call package joy because you can open it up anytime and it really does prime you, primes your brain, primes your, your people for building some joy. So appreciation is basically thinking about remembering, focusing on amplifying and sharing the good stuff. Um, so you're looking for things to appreciate, to enjoy. If the holidays are a very difficult season, then I encourage people to, you know, prayerfully 
you know, look for what is good. What can you enjoy? Um, what, what is a silver lining uh, for you? And just trying to help people. It doesn't, not to minimize the hard stuff, but to actually give your brain what you need to better navigate the hard stuff. So we're looking for the good stuff. And you know what? I encourage people create a list of appreciation before you even go into the holidays. Um, what do you like? What are highlights for you about the holidays? You know, what about the people that you interact with? What do you enjoy? Um, and the nice thing about appreciation is it, is it really does prime our brain to look and to find God and God's presence in all of what's going on. So appreciation kind of sets the tone. It sets the stage for interacting with Emmanuel. Um, and I find, you know, doing this stuff for nearly 20 years, I find that if, if people can feel appreciation long enough, then it's really not a hard jump to sense and enjoy God's presence. But oftentimes our brain just can't activate those joy files, so to speak. So spend some time appreciating God's gifts. And then we start talking to Emmanuel about what he sees when he looks at the holidays. Uh, particularly, what does he see when he looks at some of the people that I might have a hard time being glad to be with over the holidays. Mm. You know, I will, I will get a little bit of what we call uh, God sight, heart sight, or what our friends call eyesight and joyful journey to so just, you know, God, what do you see here when you look at this? Mm. So the big question is how is it like you to create appreciation? So with, with the conditions, you know, you'll encounter, how is it like you to create some appreciation? What does that look like? Sound like, um, I just want you thinking about that today. That's good. Amy, I know you've been practicing this and teaching this for a long time as well. Any thoughts on this? Yeah, I think sometimes it is helpful for us to look for the smallest things that we can find that um, create appreciation right. in us because around the holidays, man, there can be so many expectations of perfection. And so I think if we recognize that, you know, just, wow, cleaning up after Thanksgiving dinner and my sisters in laws always pitch in and we have like a nice, pleasant, joyful conversation. So um, we don't have to create expectation of, you know, the table is going to be perfect and all the children are going to behave well. So looking for those small things that we appreciate throughout the whole season. And because we usually will realize, oh, when I look back on this, it's the little moments with people that have been special mm -hmm. or little moments with animals or in nature. So I think it's yes. always always good to have a few um, of those packaged moments that aren't connected with people because we're going to have some moments during the holidays when thinking about people is a little bit challenging. So we can kind of prime the appreciation pump by remembering moments in nature, moments with animals that we've loved, things like that. And then we can once we get the appreciation moving a little bit, we can move on and remember that, yeah, we do have a lot of people that we appreciate in our life. Mm. That's really, really helpful. Yes. I, I like to focus on just even small things. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't have to have the Disneyland experience every right. holiday or every moment with a family member, but just th even those small little gifts that God gives uh, can have a big impact as we treasure them up in our hearts. So thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Amy, I love what you shared because, you know, it's such a good reminder. You know, our legacy is, is who we are. I want people to think about that today. Your legacy with your family, your friends, your community, it's who you are. And, you know, what you do comes out of who you are. But, you know, keep that in mind. The best gift that you have to give your people is you. Mm -hmm. And I like how Amy really makes appreciation so possible um, and just keep it practical. I had just such wisdom today. Mm. Well, this leads us to the next skill I'm very excited about. I call these uh, sharing relational stories. And at Thrive, we call these four plus stories because it engages the four, four parts of the engine in your emotional brain and plus the, the left brain, which is kind of the analytical brain. So these are the kinds of stories that basically they're whole brain stories, we might say. Um, and what makes them whole brain stories is you're include, including the elements that all these different parts of the engine require um, to be working, so to speak. So you got to have eye contact. 
right? Because I'm engaged with you. This is a story. If I'm telling you a joy story, I'm looking at you. And um, I have to be able to convey the emotion on my face and in my voice. So you need to see some joy. You need to hear it. Um, and I want to describe how does joy feel, you know, when I'm feeling joyful, what are some of those descriptor words to, for the joy I might feel, um, or a body sensation, I might feel light, I might feel excited, um, I feel relaxed in my shoulders. So you're trying to paint a picture there, and it's autobiographical, and it's concise. The moment these stories get beyond two, three, five minutes, it's, it's too long, as far as training goes. You want to make these stories just kind of compact and clear and compelling and you know what's fun about these stories because you can you can really pass along a lot of different skills with these stories mm -hmm. but it's it's a great way to really engage people everybody loves stories that's why we love movies and songs you know they're, they're stories they're rich it's just it's a treasure trove um, so you're you're just kind of engaging and passing on some joy and some skills and it's also a chance to really share your heart and your values yeah I find you know a lot of people think about evangelism, they get very anxious about it because they're worried about having the right words and knowing all the right information. Um, I kind of liken this to, to uh, um, storytelling evangelism, so to speak. So I can really share my heart with people through stories. Maybe they're joy stories or return to joy stories or God stories, um, acting like myself stories. So there's a lot of different kinds of stories that you can tell, but I find it's a great way um, to for family members that might, you know, might not know Jesus or might have some distortions about Jesus or Jesus followers. I find that stories are just a great way to reach some hearts without getting the defenses up, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So stories, there's just so much potential here. Um, but again, the big question is, how is it like you to share relational stories? What does it look like? What does it sound like? Um, what kind of moments, you know, how can you kind of set it up by in, inviting people to hear something that you have to say? What, what everybody thinking about that? Mm. Mm. That's good. Any thoughts on that, Amy, Dad? Yeah, I think about um, in my childhood, there was lots of storytelling over the holidays because we would visit with people we didn't see the rest of the year. And, you know, knowing these um these skills and knowing what a four plus story is, it would be great to go back and look at some of the stories that you know are probably going to be told at the holidays because we usually have kind of a family repertoire of stories and, and think about how to bring in these elements into some of the stories that you usually tell at the holidays mm -hmm. so that you're aware of what emotions do I want to mention? What, how can I bring in the body sensations? Um, and so, you know, and how can I tell this story more concisely? I know that we usually drag it out, um, but it's great to go back and look at some of the stories that you know you probably usually tell over the holiday, holidays and make them stories that are gonna have a relational impact and are going to be helping um, grow the brains and the captain in the people around you. And this is such an important part of the maturity skill of knowing what our the identity of our family, who are we in God's bigger picture? What is it like us to do? And so I just love looking back at those family stories. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's really rich. And it's interesting that, you know, you're looking back with joy on that was one of the highlights. And in mm -hmm. our modern world where we've got screens going and we've got to have all these exciting over the top experiences, sometimes we, we make it more complicated than we have to. And we miss some of the really satisfying, very reachable, simple things like just gathering around and telling some good stories. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. who doesn't like a good story? So this is a great skill to share at the holidays. Well, and we need, need another skill, Chris, uh, at the holidays as well. So take us a little deeper onto skill nine of taking a breather. Yeah, this is a big one. You know, if, if anything's going to make the holidays hard, difficult, um, painful, it is, it is when I or others don't pause to let us take a breather. So it's when we get overwhelmed. And even the good stuff can, can kind of be overwhelming, right? So skill nine is when... I'm interacting with you and I see that you're kind of looking like you're getting maxed and I back off. 
I turn down the volume, I, I disengage, and I let you rest. So this is, this is like your relational life preserver here. And by and far, most families really don't do very well on this particular skill. Um, just because as a society, we don't do very well on this particular skill. So if you want to keep those joy levels high, and if you want to have, make some really meaningful, special memories with your family or your friends, look for signs that people need a breather, including yourself, and, and find your style of how do you disconnect while still honoring people, because basically we honor people when we let them rest. So how can you do this relationally? Um, so this is the pause, lets us recharge, uh, it honors weaknesses, it respects limitations, and all of us have weaknesses, all of us have limitations. So this is basically saying, you know what, I see that you, you look like you need a little fresh air. Why don't you let me do this? You go outside and get some fresh air. Because um, basically when we're push pushed beyond our limits, the results are not good. You can predict that. 100% when you are pushed beyond your limits, it's not going to be good. And so we become very crispy relationally, emotionally, mentally when we're pushed beyond our capacity. So what this skill does is it creates some safety. It also reflects God's heart because God is a good shepherd that lets the sheep rest, mm -hmm. right? He feeds us when we're hungry. He gives us water when we're thirsty. He, he clothes us, he covers us. He's, he's the God that recognizes those weaknesses and says, hey, let me help. Um, so, you know, how is it like us to give ourselves and each other a breather during the holidays? What can you expect? Because I can think of family members or friends, their plates are full, they're, they're pretty maxed out. So I know when I spend time with them, how can I give them a cup of cold water, so to speak, by letting them rest, recognizing they're maxed out, letting them take a breather. Um, so having a language and giving people permission because I feel seen, Nick and Amy, if you see that I'm maxed out and we're interacting, mm -hmm. you say, Chris, you know what? You look like you need a breather. I feel seen. And so, and then I feel loved. I'm like, wow, that's all really awesome. You guys saw that. You're right on. So I like, I really want people today thinking about this skill because um, all the other skills in many ways are possible when we are practicing this skill. The other ones get really hard if we're not recognizing when people are maxed and letting them rest. Good, and it comes to mind in our culture, my experience is that people think it's a sign of strength to not need a breather. Yeah. No, 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 I'm fine. They're in the kitchen, they're juggling 14 things. No, I got this, oh, I don't, now, hey, why don't you go? No, 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 I got it. So people may not appreciate our initial attempts to uh, recognize the overwhelm we see in them and, and to give them an option. Uh, but I like what you said earlier, Chris, that it's, it's up to them if they're going to receive that or not. But just by us even introducing that concept, it might plant a seed that they'll begin to become aware of this need in themselves. And as you model it, I've, I've seen people model like, wow, I just, I just need a minute. I'm just going to go, you know, take a little walk. I'll be back in five. And, and it's like, oh, I didn't even know that was a thing. You know, I didn't even know <laughs> you could do that because... I kind of grew up where, no, you're not weak and take a break. You just are strong and push through. Yeah. So that's well said. Yeah. Well, I'll add uh, also that, um, and this it might be surprising advice, but I would recommend that people um, give yourself some margin and lower your standards mm -hmm. a little bit. So a funny holiday story in my family I grew up with a mom who, you know, leading up to the holidays, you were polishing silver and, you know, getting out the china and, you know, doing all kinds of really, really intense tasks. And so the lead in to the holidays was not really all that fun. And so as my mom got older, there was a time where we said, really, mom, we are actually going to like, we're just going to buy some paper plates <laughs> and we are going to, you know, purchase some of our desserts and whatever. And I remember after that Thanksgiving, we were sitting down and my mom just looked at me and she said, wow, we still had a lot of fun, didn't we? <laughs> and I said, yeah, we really did not miss all that fancy china and silver. And um, 
So sometimes we set our standards around things that are not necessarily relational. And so I would say, give ourselves a little bit more margin mm -hmm. and allow ourselves to, um, you know, it's okay if you bring the, the plates and napkins to your kids' mm -hmm. Christmas party. <laughs> you don't have to be the one to bring everything every time. So. Well, that's so oh, good. Yeah. And, you know, we, so often we do what we've always done or we do what we've seen modeled by our family. And so I love that you're kind of interjecting another way to look at it. And so maybe part of what we need to do in looking back is, you know, say what, what's most important and again, what might hinder that. So Chris, with that in mind, would you take us and our, our listeners uh, into an exercise to practice some of these things? Yeah, so I had a fun little exercise here, friends. I'm just going to kind of walk you through it. And I want you to, to practice this as I take you through the steps. So the first is, the first step is basically, I want you to think about a favorite holiday memory. Um, you know, what is a favorite holiday memory? Just like this particular Thanksgiving was really good, or this, this connection over the holiday break, or this Christmas morning, or whatever it is. I just want you to think about what is a favorite memory for you. Um, and then consider what makes it special. I'll just give you a brief moment. What is that memory? What makes it special? Why is it your favorite? Just pause for a moment. Now, I hope that you've got some thoughts here that are kind of swirling around as you think about that favorite memory um, and some of the ingredients that, that make that very special for you. And then the next step I want to have you consider is, you know, what do you want to see when you look back on this holiday season, right? So obviously you've got this very special memory and some aspects of that were very meaningful for you with that lens now. When you look back on this Thanksgiving or this Christmas and this new year, like, you know, what do you want to see? What do you want to see when it's January 3rd, as Nick said earlier, you're looking back on it. Just think, take a moment. What will you be glad that you did or you shared? I hope you have a few thoughts that are percolating here. And there's one more step. And so now we're just going to kind of take a moment and talk to Emmanuel. And right, we're going to say, Lord, do you have a thought or an image today that you want to share about what is important to you about my holiday season here? Like what, what's important to you, Lord, when you look at the holidays that I'm about to enjoy? I just want you to ask that question and then we'll just be still for a moment. I just want you to think about what, what comes to mind as you ask Emmanuel that question. What do you sense that he values when he looks ahead at your holidays here? Now, these thoughts can be very subtle. And for some of us, we might need to have this discussion as we go take a walk. If we're a high energy responder, we might need to move. Others, we might just need to find that quiet place and sit for a while, but this can be very subtle. So for example, when I asked Emmanuel that question, uh, the thought that came to my mind was quality time with my family, right? lead very wild, crazy lives. And just, just having my son having my attention will be probably one of the best gifts that I could give my sons just to have my attention. So something, just that simple little thought, I go, oh, 
wow, well, yeah, that's, that's something that I really need to protect and make sure that happens, you know, consistently. So I just want to encourage all of you today that um, you might need more time. We just took, you know, a couple minutes to go through these steps, but I would encourage you to practice this several times and take more time for each question. Because the goal, again, is to start with a feeling a lot of appreciation, and that will set the tone uh, as we engage the captain and we share minds with Emmanuel. So, but I hope that was a fun little practice. Step. Yeah, I see a big smile on Amy's face, and, and that was, you know, very meaningful for me just to spend some time in Emmanuel's presence and with my friends and just bring those questions before God. And then some things really touched my heart. I'm like, yeah, that's simple, but that would be really meaningful if I did that with my kids and my family. Yes. And that's what we're after. That's what we're after friends. I just want to have encourage everyone to take time to do that. Practice that a little more. Well, fantastic. Well, I want to make sure we have time for some Q and a. So uh, if you have questions about anything we've talked about today, we welcome you to go ahead and, write those in the Q&A window or the chat window, and we'll be uh, funneling those over to Chris and Amy here in just a moment. And also, as we're getting ready to prepare for the new year, I want to give you uh, an opportunity to know what's coming uh, so that you can see if there's an opportunity for you to get more training, a more practical application of these uh, life-changing relational brain skills. Um, so what we have coming up in January is uh, a new batch of our online marriage groups we'll be launching. You can find that at happyhappymarriage.org. Just happyhappymarriage.org is the website. Uh, the courses aren't, or the, the dates and times aren't listed yet, but there is a preference form. So you can say, hey, I would love one on this date and this time. And you can let us know because we're forming some groups uh, here now that will be launching in the new year. My wife and I lead and facilitate some of those groups. So they're just six weeks for uh, 90 minutes a week. Uh, walking through the four habits of joy-filled marriage that was written by Chris Corsi and uh, Marcus Warner. And um, man, my wife and I, we just love going through this group. We're so glad we get to lead it because we get to keep getting uh, to practice these skills of building joy in our marriage and building that quieting together, that cuddling. It's like, man, this is, this is a cheap date night. We get to build appreciation and cuddle and just connect at the heart level. There's some very practical, simple, and yet deeply enriching uh, skills for your marriage. So check that out uh, at happyhappymarriage.org and let us know if you'd like to join one of those groups. Uh, you can just buy the book and do it yourself, but we've, we've heard from couple after couple of like, we had the book, but it wasn't until we got in a small group and we were doing it every week that the skills really took off. So that might be a great gift for your spouse. Uh, or if this is a lady watching going like, well, you know, you might just need to give your husband a, an overt hint this is what I want for Christmas. Buy me one of these groups. Let's do this for six weeks, starting in January. Um, and then secondly, coming up in San Antonio, Texas, we are having a thriving marriage weekend, February 21 and 22, that Chris and Jen are going to be leading. So this is a live marriage retreat. It's a Friday night and a Saturday. Uh, and they're expecting um, you know, a good, good bunch of folks to show up at a, at a large church there. But you don't have to be there. You can, I know some people flying in just to get this opportunity to be at a marriage retreat um, taught by our dear friends, Chris and uh, Jen, who have been, uh, again, teaching these relational skills in the context of marriage and family for many, many years. Uh, so this is kind of a premier marriage uh, retreat experience, in my opinion. So you may want to think about flying down to San Antonio if you're out of the area to, to get that weekend with your spouse. Again, a great Christmas gift idea or a hint for your spouse of, hey, I want this. Put this in my stocking, please. <laughs> And then, of course, lastly, um, we've got uh, our premier relational skills training is our five-day Thrive Tracks. I'm not going to go into all the detail of this. You can read about it on our website, and I'll give Amy a chance in a moment just to talk about the impact that she's seen in her life and now through many trainings, uh, lives of others. Uh, but these five-day trainings, we've got one coming up in March in Peoria, Illinois, just outside of Chicago. Uh, that's where I went to my first one and my second one with my wife. And these tracks are where over the course of several years, you get an opportunity to learn in a relational context, these 19 relational brain skills. You can learn about relational skills from a book. You can learn relational skills in relationship with people that have them. So this is, this is just the, the black belt level relational skills training that is really transformative in your life and in and empowers you to bring this back home to your family, your church, your community in a deeper way. 
Uh, so if you're interested or intrigued by that, we encourage you to go ahead and check out our, our website. I'm going to put that up here now. Uh, just where you see that is thrivetoday.org and then forward slash thrive. But if you just go to the Thrive Today website, the, the menu at the top is pretty easy to navigate and you'll find what you're looking for uh, pretty easily, I think. Uh, but Amy, you've been teaching and training these things for, you know, a long time now. And uh, I would just love to hear, you know, what has been your experience briefly, you know, with these, with these tracks and what encouragement would you have for anyone considering, you know, attending one of these in the new yeah. year? Yeah. Well, of course, I would encourage everybody to go. Um, I would you know, the flex track true identity is one that you can go to whether you have someone, um, a partner that you want to go through the training or not. And then the others you can go to with a partner, but it really, really changed my life. Um, there was just a lot that I didn't realize I had missed out on. And there were some big gaps in the way that I interacted with people. And so it has been, um, it's been life changing and it's been a good opportunity to, um, to connect better with lots of people with, with the relationships that are important. So um, I just have to really highly recommend it and um, just, yeah, just sign up and do dig deep into all of this stuff because it is really um, the thing that has brought the single most amount of transformation to my life and I've tried lots of things. <laughs> well and you've been walking with the Lord for, for decades so for you to say that um, you know here and I know a little bit about your background all the different you know mm -hmm. versions of, of Christian truth and practice you've put into practice that have been helpful but yeah. for you to say this has been the most transformative uh, in your life is that's saying something, Amy. Yeah, thank uh, you. That's right. Well, fantastic. Well, we have a few questions uh, that have come up and I'd love to see, Chris, could you answer this? Two different people said something similar to this, like, uh, what can I do to be happy to be with family that are not happy to be with me? What, what advice would you have for me? Yeah, well, that's, that's a great question. Um, part of it is being tender with weaknesses. And so there's some of our family members have some, some weaknesses are more obvious than others. And so if we're glad to be with others, they're not glad, it's not reciprocated. Um, that could be very much a weakness. And so we want to be tender with weaknesses. We don't try to force it. Um, we when it hurts us because it can trigger our own attachment pain right so we, it's this is something we want to invite Emmanuel into I would ask Emmanuel how do you see these family members and I would invite Emmanuel even into the pain that I feel that they can't join me in this and and they don't feel that joy back at me um, that's really sad and I suspect that Emmanuel probably has some feelings about that as well um, and, and it would be good to find out, you know, how does Emmanuel handle that? Because people weren't always glad to be with him when he walked this earth, right? <clears throat> Sometimes people want to push him off a cliff. Um, so it's like, Lord, how, you know, what do you do with this? How do you see these folks? And, um, and I need you to help me with some of the pain that I feel. I, I think those are all good things to be practicing ahead of time so that we have some of, some of his vision uh, into those places. That's really, really good, Chris. And, you know, my heart goes out to the two folks that said that. And I'd even thought of that before, uh, you know, uh, as we're going through the webinar that I know some of us are going to be in situations where we turn on our relational circuits, we're smiling, we're looking them in the eye and genuinely glad to be with them. And they just, they don't get it. They don't reciprocate. They, they, you know, and that, that can be a painful thing. Um, and so I love what you said about, you know, ahead of time and Lord, this is my concern. Lord, last time, this is what I felt. Lord, how do you want to help me with that? Emmanuel, how can you fill me? Jesus, how can you fill me with your love and your peace so that I can pour out the love? It says in Romans 5, 5, that the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit that he's given us. So Lord, how do you want to fill my heart with your love? The kind of love that Jesus said, we need to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us and mistreat us. That's supernatural, <laughs> uh, but yeah. but ahead of time, I love the just I'm I'm going into the holidays. I want to represent you well, and how can you comfort me in my pain and fill me with love beyond me mm -hmm. to 
to pour out without expectation of anything in return. Yeah, and what is Jesus doing? You know, Jesus washes dirty feet. And so sometimes when I encounter this um, with people that I really care about, and I say, Jesus, what are you doing when, when this isn't reciprocating? It kind of hurts, you know? I don't feel understood. Um, uh, Jesus, what are you doing? Sometimes I just, he reminds me he's washing their feet. Like, oh, mm. wow, like you wash mm. their feet. Like, I would not have thought to do that. So I'm glad mm. I talked to you about that. So we never know what, you know, what he'll say or do, but it's, it's a beautiful thing to interact with the living God. Mm-hmm. It's true. And we never know how our seeds that we plant today and, you know, God's going to water those. And, and next time they might be a little bit warmer. Yes. You know, some people have just been through hard things in life and tend to be a little crispy on an average day. And, you know, um, but you never know how God might break, soften the, soften the heart, melt the ice a little bit. And, uh, you know, you might be a part of that just through yeah. sharing joy. So mm. that's right. Well, we had another question come in, Chris. Uh, our friend Evie DeRoos asks, is there going to be different skills besides the four habit books that are taught at the February weekend? Yes, definitely. Um, there will be. Uh, there will be some similar exercises and there'll be a, we, we actually go into a lot of different, a lot more skills. Um, because with the four habits book, we're just very limited. We kind of picked a few of the, you know, the, the foundational skills. So in a weekend, we actually go into a lot more skills and particularly, we go into a lot of the Emmanuel training that we don't heavily go into in the book. So, yeah, I'd say it's good to be familiar with the book and the exercises. You'll get that much more out of it. Um, but it's different and unique enough. I don't, think, I don't think that'd be an issue at all. Yeah, and I know there's a lot of new content in the, uh, in the actual retreat. You talk about attachment styles and, yes. you know, you give more some, some practical things that are just not in the book. So it's... It's a great compliment. They're both very yeah. rich and very impacting. That's right. That's right. Well, great. Well, I think we, uh, we might have gone through our, our, our questions already. I think you guys just did such a great job sharing so many helpful things that people are feeling full and they've got, they've got their backpack filled with some good stuff to get them through the holidays with uh, hope and with a good plan to uh, really make it uh, as relationally joyful and peaceful as possible. Um, so, so, Chris, I'd love to just hear any final thoughts or encouragements from you, whether it's about our upcoming events or just holidays, and then we'll give Amy a chance as well before we wrap up. Yeah, thank you, Nick. Well, you know, I just want to highlight again, uh, for some reason, just relational legacy has kind of been on my mind this whole webinar. So I just want to encourage people that, you know, when you do this stuff and you practice these skills, you're actually leaving a relational legacy uh, with your people. And and that is something that really stands the test of time. So Mm -hmm. there's a lot of freedom in that, you know, just sharing your heart, and being available, being present, loving others, and expressing it well is this is really some of the best gifts that you can give the people that you'll be spending time with over the holidays. Mm-hmm. Mm, thank you, Chris. Yeah. And Amy, any final thoughts or encouragements? Yeah, I just if we can just all remember that um, it's the relational connections that we'll remember when things are over with. We won't remember if we served the um, fanciest uh, meal with the most complicated casserole ever. Um, But we will remember those relational connections and the people around us will remember that. Um, So spending time just, you know, whether it's sitting on the floor with a child and putting together a puzzle or listening to a story of um, an old person that you've heard the story over and over. These are gifts. These really are building that relational legacy that Chris is talking about. That's so great, Amy. Yes. Well, my final encouragement would be to, uh, if you found this webinar helpful, to, to share this. You mm-hmm. know a lot of other people that are heading into the holidays just like you are, and if you felt equipped and helped like to make your holidays even more rich and meaningful, Uh, please share this. We'll be sending out the link as we do uh, every time within 24 hours, uh, whether somebody came live or or not, they'll get the link if they registered. Uh, But people can register after the fact. So you can send this when you get this tomorrow, forward it to a friend and let them know about uh, just a very hopefully helpful and practical um, webinar with some great expressions of these relational skills, making it very practical and very applicable and very relevant to our lives. So please uh, spread the word and uh, just give this gift to uh, someone in your world that you think would benefit from it. Yes, thank you friends for being here. Thank you, Nick Mm -hmm. and Amy. It's a joy to walk this road together and just 
such an honor to be here with everybody. Yeah, we appreciate all of you guys. Yeah, well, thank you, Chris. Thanks to you and Jen for your leadership and just paving the way and, and helping us uh, with all these important life-giving skills. And same to Amy, who was first an apprentice and a learner, and now she's a, a teacher and a trainer and just spreading these is. skills. So thank you guys for, for your hearts and all you guys do. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, friend. All right. Well, until next time, bless you guys, and we'll see you again. Mm -hmm. Take care. All right. Take care. All right, bye -bye. God bless.